Welcome back to my face. My name is Brianna and I'm the head honcho here at Bambi Media. Today we are chatting with Emma Edwards who founded The Broke Generation back in 2018. She helps people get good with money. That's exactly what she says. After she overhauled her own finances and found that there was some holes, there was some things and beliefs that she really wanted to try and change and now she helps other people do the same thing. She has a incredibly engaged Instagram audience, a fantastic podcast podcast called The Broke Generation and an offshoot of that as well called Broke Business. Emma is a financial behavior specialist. She's a fantastic writer as well. She has a great newsletter. I would love for you to go and connect with her and she's a really good one to interview on podcasts as well because she's just hilarious. She's just a good time and I know you're going to learn some great things from her about how to build a sustainable podcast. She's been doing it quite a while now and how that has supported her business. The Broke Generation is a very well received podcast and in fact when it first launched it was a spotify hot pick for the week which was crazy cool so you'll learn some things you'll have a laugh and let's welcome emma edwards emma thank you so much for joining us here on pump up your pod i'm so excited emma started her show on the 1st of july 2021 i want you emma to take me back to the day and the time well maybe not that specific but the surrounds of the release of that show and tell me why you decided to do it why you decided to launch a podcast frankly i'll be really honest i started it because being in social media and being in the public eye is a lot about like following what's working following where the people are going and so there was a big part of me that was like okay people are going to podcast people like audio content I need to, you know, show up there. But the kind of happy surprise and why I kept doing it was I actually really liked that kind of content and I liked putting content out in the world outside of social media. Social media has so many benefits, but anyone that's on it will know that there are a number of drawbacks as well. And I just feel like podcasting and the people that listen to them, it really gives respect back to content and information again, in a way that social media doesn't. Like it's not as churn and burn. You can, there's such a thing as evergreen content again. And I just really like communicating in that way. I mean, you you edit my episodes, you know I can't shut up. The effort I have to put in to do a mini episode, it's never mini. I'm always there deleting the word mini out of the title. <laughs> But yeah, I just really, like, I I did it because I thought, you know, that's where the people are going. This is a really great place for these kinds of conversations. I didn't see other money podcasts that were sort of in the category of mine, of, like, the psychology and the behaviour and the habits. So I thought it was a great place to talk about this stuff. And then I just loved it. And I've put an episode out every week for the last two and a half years, barring Christmas breaks. I was so excited when you reached out and we started chatting I already knew who you were and I was just like, she is so fun and awesome that this show is going to go so well because you had a good audience already. You said what you meant. You had a great accent and you were intelligent. Like as in you weren't blowing smoke up your own ass. You were providing content that was useful for people and you knew your target audience enough. Maybe not like all the way, but you don't, you know, that changes over time anyway. So to me, this is the kind of show that's very exciting because it ticks a bunch of boxes and you know that you're gonna have an audience that's gonna be wanting and waiting for your episodes to drop. And then when you did launch, I think it was Spotify, you got into the Spotify pick of the week or something. Yeah, they sent me a cactus. <laughs> a cactus? Yeah, I was like, okay, <laughs> thanks. I assumed it would be something edible and I was like, oh, a cactus. Okay, I kind of oh, get it. That's amazing. Yeah, so then you got that and just a crazy good listenership, really. Who do you feel like it's actually for and has that changed over two and a half years? Has it changed over two and a half years? Probably not, actually. I kind of went back and looked at a couple of my older episodes recently and I was like thinking I'd be like cringing, being like, what on earth am I talking about? But actually I was like, nah, I'd probably publish that now. So I think my podcast is for people that are either already engaged with their finances and like 
you know, working towards financial goals or they're trying to get engaged with their finances. And I guess that's maybe where it's changed a little bit in that a lot of my content isn't like a beginner level, but, you know, I'm not speaking to people about how to invest $50,000. Like it's I'm, it's about starting out, building habits, building your relationship with money, uh, that sort of thing. But I guess sort of along the way, I've picked up sort of a pocket of my audience, I guess, that isn't like struggling with money and needing help at getting good with money. They either already were like that or they've kind of done that part, but they just still find the ongoing... Uh, psychological side of money really interesting so that's sort of how it sits my like target listener if I was to speak to one person is somebody that has been trying to sort out their finances has tried more sort of um, I don't want to say mainstream because I'm not like that out there but more like traditional barefoot investor style of financial content and it's still not working for them and they want to know why because that's all of what I talk about the why behind what we do with money and how we can get more value from our money and as a result more value out of our lives and more enjoyment out of our lives and our time so that's like my golden person but then sort of the fringe listenership around that is people that just find the stuff as interesting as I do and love hearing me talk about it yeah and the money psychology stuff I think is it's a very interesting niche because there's plenty of podcasts that talk about finance and investing and property and all that sort of stuff. In fact, we have clients in all those spaces, which is great. But yours is a bit different because it is that why. Like, why do you treat money this way? Why do you feel this way about money? Why do you feel like you have to go buy something when you've had a bad day? Or, you know, that conversation, I think, is a lot of what the normal person struggles with that they're trying to get over that feeling of having to spend to get some sort of reward and that's why I thought your or I think that your wardrobe freeze is a really interesting idea and if you're interested in that please go and look at Emma Edwards on Instagram under the broke generation or in TikTok on her website you'll see she's doing this wardrobe freeze and it's just fascinating You've really nailed it as far as who your target is and uh, it is very interesting content. How do you feel your show has helped you in your business or personally or both? I think it's really helped with that long-term connection with my audience or my community or whatever you want to call it. I think that showing up on social media, particularly in recent years, as TikTok has come along and video has reigned supreme and I I think that unfortunately the rise of video has put more and more emphasis on aesthetics in terms of your surroundings but also yourself. Um, you know, it's no secret, It's it's been this way for years that you will have a much greater leg up on social media if you look a certain way but I think that video is partially you know even out of podcasting it's partially done that as well you know if you've got the professional videos and the professional setup people are kind of more drawn to it but I just I still just love so much the audio side in terms of that communication you know I'm showing up every week with a long form conversation either a solo deep dive or a conversation with someone else people know that it's there they know to expect it it's not sort of like the competing with the algorithm of social media like yes there's algorithms and stuff on you know getting in the top 10 and that kind of stuff but if you're just like a little fish like me it doesn't really affect me in that way I really like that from a connection point of view in terms of opportunities because there is so much content on social media now I feel like if you have somewhere else for people to go whether it's a website or a blog or a podcast or something that is a bit more quote-unquote traditional and involves a little bit more than you know chucking up a a 60 second video not that that's easy but you know what I mean I think it's maybe helped me be taken a little bit more seriously especially as I sort of accidentally tumbled into the influencer adjacent space because you know that's how you monetize you do sponsorship particularly as a woman particularly in the financial space it can sort of dent your credibility a tiny bit whereas I think having the podcast helped me overcome that and well not overcome that but helped sort of support my credibility on that side and then I think on top of that a few opportunities I've had have come from people who listen to my podcast but 
sort of that crossover and I worked in social media for professional services for years before I did my own thing and one thing we always talked about to clients was don't forget that even if you're targeting lawyers your clients are individuals as well as lawyers and I've really noticed that because I did a talk for example for a sort of networking event for cancer nurses because one of the people on the committee there listened to my podcast for herself you know I'm not like targeting medical professionals or whatever but people listen to my show as them as individuals but they have a professional side as well and they might put me to their employer or they might be the employer or they might hear about me through someone else and that's actually where I've got I guess a lot of return if you want to put it that way it's totally unquantifiable but a lot of return from doing the podcast it's not like a you know x number of clicks and x number of likes and that converts to this much it's not like that uh it's much more of a longer term conversation that has granted me a lot of visibility yeah and i think that's what i like about it as a medium because it feels more creative in that way too where it doesn't feel so much it's a numbers game and this much this many clicks is going to convert into this many impressions which is going to sell you this many ads and then you're going to be at blah 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 like There is that side of podcasting and it's something that's going to get more intense. But at the core of what you're saying is like you've put yourself forward as a professional person talking about things that are interesting and appeal to firstly a broad range of people. And then you spread through word of mouth into other opportunities because people are engaging with your content that you're not even sort of targeting. And this is one of the big things that happened in podcasting. If you don't have when you don't realize the impact that that actually has on you as a professional person and the kind of speaking gigs that you can get off the back of that. So it is kind of unquantifiable, but it is quantifiable in the same way. Like if you started writing those things down, like, okay, this person came from here, this gig, I've made this much money. You could probably start to really have a good picture of that. And it's also not about all the money too like it's it's really about making a connection in the community and how you can support that community and how you can support yourself through that and then at some point you build up a community that's big enough that they really want more from you and then you can make a sell you can make an offer you can do whatever that you feel really aligned to so uh, I think you're smart with the way that you think about it and handle it your favorite thing about your show if you could pick one thing that you're like this is why i love it and this is why i do it every week where on social media you're like barking into the void regularly and some stuff hits and some stuff doesn't and you don't necessarily always know why there's some rhyme and reason but not entirely i think the thing i love the most about doing my show is that it's every week on a thursday you can open your app and there i am and that is the one thing that you get from me that week that's what people expect i show up for it they show up to listen to it and it's kind of like a a weekly meeting that you know i don't burn out and not post or it doesn't glitch out with the way it posts on social media or like it doesn't get completely forgotten by the algorithm and you think oh what a waste of time like I, I, maybe to condense it down that's kind of it it never it's not as throwaway and it never feels like oh that was that flopped because people know that it's gonna drop and you know you're gonna put it out and I love that you can like schedule it in advance to make sure that that all happens and it's just a really nice like anchor in my online presence. A great message, I guess, to hit on there is the huge difference between social media and algorithms versus something that is just pushed out same time to the audience that have signed up for it. You know, they've clicked on that follow button. They get a notification. It's up to them to listen to it, but they get that notification and you become part of their routine. That's kind of the coolest thing is it's like, They go on a walk and they take you with them. They hang out there washing on Saturdays. You're there with them, you know. I love that. So what's the thing that you don't like? Is there something about your show that you're like, uh, what a drag? It's not so much that I don't like it. I think it's just something I didn't expect. It's really hard to migrate an audience on social media to a podcast. Harder than I expected. I've heard this from other people as well. If you have a following on social media, it does not mean that your podcast will automatically be successful. And I guess out of that, growing your podcast audience, I personally have found it hard. I know I don't have bad listenership, but 
even in the two and a half years, my listenership is kind of stayed the same. It's not like I started with a thousand downloads and now I get 20 or whatever. It's kind of sat roughly around the same numbers and I've, I've got it up a little bit. But I think it's just a different way of thinking. You don't necessarily get that exponential growth that you do on social media if like something goes viral or whatever. Like there's, there's that positive side of algorithms too where you can actually kind of level up, I guess, your visibility quite quickly. It's much more of a gradual game and you have to talk about it. Just because someone subscribed to your show doesn't mean that they're necessarily going to... Like it will be there in their feed, but they might miss it. And titling is really important. And I think it's just... It's not that I don't like it, it's just the hardest part is remembering to talk about it i mean when we look at the statistics on it 80 percent of gen z or i think it was 75 percent of gen z find out about new podcast episodes and podcasts through social media so it's important to post on social media and the fact that you have a good audience there maybe it's a positioning thing as to you don't mention that it's part of a podcast the only thing that's sort of classifying it is that there is a microphone in front of you i mean that's the way i do it uh, that's the way others that we do for podcasting do we've we've stopped putting like not because of the engagement thing but we just saw that people were interacting better with the social snippets and the video snippets and things like that if there wasn't a reference every time to it being hey here's the pod it's for the podcast it's for the podcast it's this episode number one of the podcast or whatever we got rid of all of that no end screens just big captions with really like important pivotal moments they go way better I agree. And I've been thinking that, you know, even though a lot of my clips or whatever will get less views than maybe another reel or a TikTok, I feel like it's important in terms of your like social media shop front in a way that when someone new lands on your page, having visuals of you talking into a microphone, that in itself tells them that you have a podcast. If you can put it in your bio, it helps. But I think it's, I think that's kind of how I've shifted out of that, you know, wor- worrying about, oh, I don't really want to talk about it because it's going to bomb my engagement for the rest of the week or anything else I say that day. More thinking about like putting little, as you've sort of said, like cues to be like, podcast. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Just whisper it because again, especially for the Australian audience, if you put something like, hey, this, it's this, the Australian audience is like, oh, that's an ad. I don't want it. Even though it's not an ad, they perceive it as an ad and they will respond as that because the stupid tall poppy thing. The American audience is fine. You can do that all day and they, they, they are fine with it. But the Aussies are a different breed, which I find very interesting. So you're just going to get a little bit more creative with what you're putting out um, as far as video snippets. We went off topic there, but I mean, this is the kind of thing I could talk about all day. How have you stayed consistent releasing for two and a half years. Having Bambi edit the show, it gave me two things that I really need for myself to actually do things. A deadline slash a routine and some sort of consistency level of what I need to do. Because if you're self-editing your show, you're going to run into oh you know you a short solo episode might take you 20 minutes whereas a long guest episode where they had a cough that day and you keep having to find all those coughs or where you kept stuffing up and starting again that could take you two or three or four hours and it's really hard to know when you're going to do all of that so having like a baseline that I have to do I have to record an episode and an intro and put it in the google drive and it has to be two weeks in advance because that's when you're going to edit it and when you're going away for Christmas leave and stuff like we have to be ready before I'm not saying I couldn't do it on my own because I know loads of people that do but for me personally I feel like what would have happened for one I would have had to have done seasons I think because my show is always on evergreen I don't break for seasons I think if I was doing it myself I would have had to have done seasons but also I feel like it would have just much like many other things that are just you doing it solo it would have just got swallowed up into the chaos of life at some point and I would have missed an episode and been feeling bad about it and I know that those things aren't necessarily bad but I do think that with things like podcasts you really want to be showing up for your Thursday episode if that's when you drop them because people come to expect that of you and like you said you're in their routine so if on Thursdays they have to listen to someone else maybe they'll love that and they won't listen to you next week so the key thing that's kept me consistent is 
having editing help and also having um, like an ideas bank that I'm way ahead with because that's the hardest thing I find is coming up with constant ideas especially after two and a half years it was fine for the first year or so but now I'm like Mm, how many ways are there to say yes? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, and that's the rise of things like ChatGPT and, you know, these kind of AI tools can be helpful depending on how you use them to help you kind of get over a bit of that hump of like, what am I going to talk about in this niche? It's always good to have a bank, like Emma says. And thinking about it, like not being so rushed with it that if you know that you have to have it to us by or anyone have it you have a deadline of some point you have to have it to us by 10 a.m on a certain day not only thinking about it at 9 a.m that day to then release the thing because i can guarantee you the content that you deliver is going to be way worse than if you gave yourself at least 24 hours to do a little bit of research to think a bit more deeply to plan it a bit more so the content planning I think is huge and the consistency of having a deadline that you must stick to and even if you're doing it yourself having that regularity in your diary even for me when I first started pump up your pod ages ago I didn't have anyone else in the team that could help me edit my own stuff I was doing it when I could and I had to stop. It got swallowed up with all the billions of things as a head of a decent sized company then had to do. So I had to stop until I got to a point where I actually could outsource my own stuff to the rest of the team and felt like I was then a client of my own business. And then it actually started to, to work and the wheels didn't fall off. Last question, what is your current favorite podcast that you listen to? I have more than one, is that okay? Oh, please, of course. <laughs> okay. Wouldn't it be ever if there wasn't multiple? So I have like two that I listen to on like a personal level that I like to listen to for me, like outside of business or whatever. One is called So I Got to Thinking. It's a Sex and the City podcast out of the UK by Juno Dawson uh, and Dylan B. Jones. It's just so funny. I'm howling on my walks. Go through every episode. They're nearly at the end, so I guess I'll have to start again after that. Then How to Fail by Elizabeth Day. Really good interviews. Kind of a similar depth as like Stephen Bartlett but I prefer listening to podcasts by women I don't know what it is I really try but I'm like the the dulcet tones of a female is much more my vibe and then for business I love listening to my friend Peter has a podcast called The Business Fondle. It's really good about learning about online business and she's a gun at email marketing. So she's really good at like teaching you about going out and making bank in your business and selling your products and that kind of thing. And the other one is called No Room for Doubt by Kyra Matthews. It's actually also out of the UK. She's a business coach. She's coaching me at the moment and I just love everything she says and does. <laughs> oh, wow. What a good list. Oh, my gosh. Four okay, good so wrecks. We are definitely going to put all those links in the description of this audio and video. We're also going to put all the links to Emma just generally here so that you can go and connect with her in all the ways. Go and listen to The Broke Generation if you have not listened to this show yet. It is amusing, it's interesting, it's insightful, it's intelligent. Emma's a real crack up. She has good guests on the show. Like, I'm not, I mean, maybe I'm biased because we work with Emma anyway, but I just think it's a great flipping show. So go and check it out. Follow her on all the socials and all the things. And I just want to say thank you so much for sitting down with me today and having a chat on Pump Up Your Pod. I love having you in our life. <laughs> yeah. And, um, and you're, you're a good egg. So thanks so much. Thank you so much. I would not be sitting here as a podcaster without you. So I am equally grateful for your presence in my life. <laughs> <laughs>